it's a great pleasure for me to be with you this evening as we launch the History Department's annual lecture series. I'd like to thank Nick Grawl, Glennis Young, and the History Department staff who made the series possible. It takes a lot of work to put these events together and bring them to life, and they have my sincere gratitude. Maybe we can just give them a hand. It's wonderful to see another full audience here tonight, um, and we're really grateful for your support. Before I begin my introductory remarks, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Since I arrived at UW in the fall of 2021, I've been repeatedly asking a question, a particular question, of myself and colleagues through the, throughout the college. What makes us, the University of Washington and the College of Arts and Sciences, distinctive? What attributes can we identify that make us uniquely well positioned to excel in the ways that we already do and upon which we can build to the greater benefit of those we serve both within the university's walls and the communities that extend well beyond them. The University of Washington sits among a small group, as you know, a small group of outstanding public research universities that are its peers, all renowned for their very high impacts in research, their excellence in teaching, and their outstanding levels of engagement with and service to communities near and far. But we're also different from those peers in important ways that matter. We're not, in my view, here to merely replicate what happens in colleges of arts and sciences at places like UCLA or Berkeley or Michigan. We have our own distinctive work to do, our own distinctive story to tell, one that matters enormously for our state, for our nation, and for the world. So when I ask the question, what makes us distinctive, inevitably the answer that, that rises is our place. The work we work every day in a world-class global city, perched on the Pacific Rim, in the midst of one of the world's most powerful hubs of technological innovation, within a realm of geological wonders, artistic excellence, rich intellectual ferment, and incredible natural beauty, and in the ancestral homelands of 29 Native American tribes. We also live in a city characterized as many cities are by pronounced income inequality, a serious housing crisis, an opioid epidemic, and regionally specific impacts of the climate crisis. These latter issues may be nationally in even global grand challenges, but they're nevertheless inflected in specific ways by this unique place in which we find ourselves. We have much to learn from this wonderful, beautiful, complicated place we call the Pacific Northwest. For these reasons, I've been encouraging the development of place-based instruction in our college. Some of the faculty here will have noted a new emphasis on place-based courses in what we formerly called our Early Fall Start program, and which is relaunching this August with a new name, College Edge. An example of place-based education already exists in our wonderfully successful Humanities First program for first-year students. The curriculum in Humanities First Sequence relies heavily on experiential learning through guided day-long field trips to places like our International District, where I was fortunate to accompany a group of Humanities First students um, on a tour led by Frank Abe through the cultural landscape of John Okada's 1957 novel, No No Boy. Learning about the history of Japanese internment while walking through the spaces where its history could be seen and felt with books in hand in spaces like the Panama Hotel the train station and on street corners was an experience those students and I will never forget. It's a form of education that only we can provide because of our location, one that helps students understand the world and themselves through this place. That's just one example. There are many, many other courses throughout the college that use our place as a laboratory for learning. I was especially pleased to see that the lecture series that begins this evening is yet one more excellent example. The focus of this year's series, Seattle and the Salish Sea, Building and Belonging, will include explorations of the distinctive and deeply important histories of this place we call home. 
By examining groups of people who've made a home and identity within this region and from a large range of perspectives, the speakers in this series will shed new light on places we thought we knew well, on issues with which we continue to struggle, and on the rich historical dimensions of our urban, rural, and cultural landscape. I hope you'll consider attending the entire series if you can, which will include lectures by Josh Reed, who will examine how the Snohomish Nation worked to meet the challenges of living within a colonial system. Devin Nahr will present on settlement by Sephardic Jews from the Ottoman Empire. Elena Campbell will look at Seattle's engagement with peoples from Russia and the USSR. And finally, Jim Gregory will be detailing Seattle's history of housing and racial exclusion. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing Professor Emeritus John Finley, who will launch this wonderful series. Professor Finley began his career at the University of Washington in 1991 as an assistant professor in the Department of History. An award-winning scholar of social and urban history in the 20th century United States, Finley's particular focus has been on the history of the North American West and the Pacific Northwest. He's the author of many articles and books that focus on Native American history, regional identity, and literature in the Pacific Northwest, World's Fairs of Washington State, the Nuclear West, among other things. His books include, and there are many of them, he's had a very prolific career, award-winning work, books that include People of Chance, Gla Gambling in American Society from Jamestown to Las Vegas, Magic Lands, Western Cityscapes and, Ameri and American Culture from after 1940, Atomic Frontier Days, Hanford in the American West, which he published with Bruce Heavily, and The Mobilized American West, 1940 to 2000. He's also served as managing editor of Pacific Northwest Quarterly and as director for the study of the Pacific Northwest, and twice, and this is deeply meaningful to me, and I, I really mean this, he twice served as chair of the history department, and that is service for which I and his colleagues are deeply grateful. The title of Professor Finley's lecture tonight is City and Citizens, Seattleites and Their Rights, 1850 to 2000. How did Seattle's populations change during that period, and how were they shaped by the nation's evolving concepts of citizenship? By examining the historical demographics of the city and looking at what groups of people came to and settled in Seattle over the decades, and by exploring how laws and policies regarding citizenship influenced who came and stayed and who was and was not welcome in the city, his lecture will provide the perfect opening framework for this series, showing us how those laws and policies governed immigration and naturalization, voting rights and civil rights, and the status of Native people, among others. As Seattleites contested and struggled with these national guidelines, we'll see how they sometimes created a regionally specific, indeed a place-specific, history of citizenship rights. Thank you for being here, and please help me welcome Professor John Finley. Thanks so much for that warm introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'm really delighted to be asked to do this, and um, uh, I hope it's uh, helpful <clears throat> to, in setting up not just um, my own ideas, but also the ideas of the four people who follow me. They're just terrific scholars and, and teachers, and I'm, I'm really honored to be in the group with them. It took me a while to figure out what I wanted to talk about tonight when I was invited to do this talk. Um, over the course of my career here, there are two courses I enjoy teaching especially. One was History of the Pacific Northwest, and the other is the History of American Citizenship. What you're going to hear tonight is a mashup of both courses. I'm going to do a one-hour lecture that covers roughly two five-credit courses. <laughs> so you're getting a bargain. <laughs> my focus offers a, a conversation between nation and city. Especially after 1880, decisions were made at the federal level about citizenship. For the most part, Seattle had very little influence on those decisions. But those decisions had a lot of influence on Seattle. Moreover, citizenship issues eliminate aspects of our urban history we might otherwise overlook. Thinking about issues related to citizenship helps us see the history of our own city more clearly. Moreover, our city offers a valuable lens through which to look at what they're doing in Washington, D.C., the other Washington, when they make decisions about citizenship. And then I have one other purpose besides this kind of conversation between city and nation, and that is 
trying to lay the groundwork for, the, for my colleagues who follow me, trying to provide context and background and details that might flush out some of the issues they're going to raise in the coming weeks. In particular, I try to account for demographic change in Seattle. What groups came here to reside? Why and when did they come? How are they regarded by people already here, including indigenous peoples? And what's ri what rights could they exercise? Three things to keep in mind as I go through this material. Um, I'm defining citizenship mainly as the right to vote. Now that's a gross oversimplification. Uh, citizenship is such a layered, complicated topic. Um, I'm going to get into it a little bit, but um, it's, it's so complex and layered, I just need to simplify it for the most part and talk about who could vote. We'll, we'll look at African Americans, we'll look at Native Americans, we'll look at women and how their rights to participate in society were increased. We also pay close attention to immigrants, whether they're welcome or not. Could they attain voting rights by getting naturalized, or was that door not open to them? There are, in fact, first-class citizens and second-class citizens and probably more ranks, more, more numbers. Um, there are special labels, um, aliens ineligible for citizenship or for naturalization, generally meant Asians, American nationals for Filipinos. Um, where do these particular terms come from? So that's one. I'm going to simplify citizenship, but we're going to get into some of the complexities. But most of the time, I'll just be being who had the vote. Just as a way to simplify things and get through some of the five credit stuff you're not, you're not having to do. Second, I rely heavily on the US census of population. This is a, a, an indispensable source for historians. It's also maddening way too often. I could spend hours ranting about it, but um, tonight I try to accept, accept it as it is. It is what it is. Like citizenship too, keep in mind, the census is a federal project, a national project, something that Seattle has to accept rather than shape itself. Third, I mainly provide demographic information about things going on in the municipal boundaries of Seattle, within the city limits. From time to time, I'll go outside those limits just to um, clarify or because there's better data there. But um, pay attention to what I mean when I'm talking about Seattle. Most of the time, it means in the city. Some things that are going to recur and that I'm not going to have time to go into too deeply. First of all, I'm just stunned at how often American citizenship is modified or redefined by wars. And I guess I'm stunned also by the ubiquity of wars. As an historian studying the US for many years, I shouldn't be surprised by this. But the, the prominence of wars in transforming citizenship, it just surprises me. Another is that periods of reform and reaction in immigration policy generally overlap with reform and race relations more broadly within the United States, with civil rights and voting rights. So another component that's enormous is the prominence of race in talking about how people are treated differently. So there's a, a number of themes that will be tying things together. But again, these are things I can't always explore in the depth I would like to. There will be a question and answer period afterwards if that can help uh, answer some of your questions. But um, I'm sure, though, there's way more here that could be gotten into than, than I'm going to be able to do tonight. Our focus begins in the middle of the 19th century. The city of Seattle was founded by American colonizers in 1851, and it was incorporated under the laws of Washington Territory in 1869. Across those two decades, the, the non-native population of Seattle remained small. It contained perhaps 150 non-natives in 1860. By 1870, the census recorded roughly 1,100 native, non-natives. So there's a 20-year period where not much happens in terms of what the settlers, the colonizers, wanted to happen in terms of building a town and developing an economy. And nothing happened among the whites in Seattle. Nothing happened to really transform or even worry about, about citizenship. A key exception to this um, quietude um, was the experience of Native Americans. By 1857, 
natives had had a system of treaties and reservations imposed on them in the, round, in the area that became Seattle. Now, treaties and reservations were themselves something of a new policy. Um, removal policy for Indians had pretty much disintegrated in the 1840s, and the government had come up with a, a, new, a new combination. Treaties, which had been used pretty substantially, and reservations, which are still rather new in the way they were constructed and imagined in the 1850s. As instruments of colonization, treaties mainly took away rights from natives and pressured them to acculturate to white ways, perhaps even to become themselves citizens, although that was a, a path that many native peoples were not eager to walk down right away. Treaties were enormously important, though. They meant that natives were now living in a new and different legal world, and they had to find ways to defend themselves in that world. They had to find lawyers, in part, to resist or modify the colonial regime. At the same time, they were also active and important residents of Seattle. They provided the main source of labor for decades. They offered spouses and offspring to form families with, and in so many ways shaped the life of the Puget Sound area. And fortunately, Josh Reed's going to devote his talk next week to the implications of these treaties and uh, the impact of this colonization on natives in the area. But mostly I want to make the point that for the white settlers who arrived, not much happened for the first two decades. The, the, the pioneers arrived, lay out of town, and then hit the snooze button. If we move our focus, though, from local to nation, to the two decades from 1850 to 19, 1870, those are more momentous at the national level. In fact, during those two decades, a series of events dramatically transformed citizenship and concepts of citizenship in the United States. Um, I'm going to talk about three of those events in particular, which are kind of obvious, but let me go over them just to remind you. First, between 1861 and 1877, the Civil War and Reconstruction ended the practice of slavery and established a new set of rights for African Americans. The defeat of the South by the North meant that people who had been property were now redefined as citizens. They had been property, now they're redefined as citizens. That's a momentous transformation. Once the war ended, the victorious Union passed the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, which respectively confirmed the termination of slavery, redefined American citizenship so as to include former slaves, and attempted to protect the votes of freedmen and freed women, well, freedmen at the time. The rights protected by these three amendments were not only those of former slaves. As we shall see, the 14th Amendment proved critical for the fate of immigrant families by prescribing what goes by the name birthright citizenship. Moreover, the same amendment formed the basis for the Supreme Court overruling anti-miscegenation laws in 1967 and recognizing the right to same-sex marriage in 2015. So these amendments have a huge impact, of course, during the 19th century, but their impact in some ways only grows in the 20th century. Furthermore, the emancipation of slaves encouraged other Americans to demand their rights as well. Women had loomed large in the abolition campaign. Upon seeing black men win the vote, they pointedly and repeatedly asked, when would women be enfranchised? Most states dithered, but Wyoming territory became the first territory or state to extend the vote to women in 1869, the same year Seattle was incorporated. In so many ways, the Civil War and Reconstruction remade American citizenship in just profound ways. However, it would take a long time before the potential of the 14th and 15th Amendments to create equal citizens before the potential was realized. Second, from its inception, the United States has been devoted to expanding its territory. It had used a variety of methods to acquire control of Western lands, purchase diplomacy, and especially military conquest, and in doing so, dispossessed other occupants and asserted national control. When it did this over and over, the country had to answer this question. What was the citizenship status of the people absorbed or conquered by the US as it moved west? In 1846 to 48, 
the United States won the war it provoked against Mexico. And in so doing, it acquired an immense amount of territory in which many citizens of Mexico resided. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, in bringing that war to an end, offered to Mexican citizens the option of becoming American citizens. This was an important statement about race because by law at the time, only white persons could become citizens through naturalization. And many Americans regarded Mexicans as non-white. On occasion, they were defined as whites too. What white meant wasn't always static or agreed upon. The offer of citizenship made by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was significant, but it wasn't consistently upheld. Sometimes the treaty was not followed, not adhered to. Speaking of treaties not being adhered to, besides Mexico, the US overpowered native nations repeatedly over the course of the 19th century. The natives were generally offered a path to American citizenship, provided they assimilated. Few took that path. Native peoples hoped to retain the rights they had had as members of sovereign nations. In signing treaties, the US attempted to, um, they recognized the nations in some ways, but signing a treaty it meant, it meant that they were a nation of some kind. But at the same time, once those treaties were signed, pressure was applied to Native peoples to conform to American, to white American ways, not to Native ways. In 1871, two years after Seattle Incorporated, Congress declared the treaty system over with. And in some ways, that heightened the attack on Native sovereignty by reducing the recognition of, of Native nations, of Native First Nations. A third set of factors that compelled Americans to rethink their meanings of citizenship came to the fore when, in the mid-19th century, hundreds of thousands of immigrants began arriving every decade from all around the world. That some immigrants would come should not have been surprising. In many ways, the new United States had laid out the welcome mat in an effort to attract immigrants, and in doing so had extended the practices and policies of people in the colonial period. In fact, one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances to the English king was that he wouldn't let enough immigrants come to the colonies to make it develop as much as the colonists themselves wanted. That was one of the reasons the colonists revolted. Restrictions on immigration. From the, our DNA as a nation is about immigration in many ways. So the nation was used to and expected immigration in its first decades. But what wasn't expected were the sheer numbers and remarkable diversity of the newcomers. The surge began to crest in the mid-1820s, um, and then it grew more and more and uh, never stopped growing. In fact, um, we, the nation wouldn't fall below the, the 1850s level or these levels until the 1930s in terms of numbers of immigration coming per year. Now, <clears throat> the immense number of immigrants were an expression in part of the rise of transnational capitalism. There's a concept that I could delve into for hours. I'm not going to do that for hours. But imagine a, a, a world where workers and money and goods circulated with increasing speed and in growing quantities. Immigrants are part of this movement. Immigrants are part of this expanding capitalism, this mobile capitalism. And capitalism in this, in this context began to sort of erase, not erase totally, but obscure, perhaps, national borders. Whereas the Civil War and the conquest of Mexico were programs that white American citizens precipitated, immigration was something of a force from outside that Americans had to react to. Over time, some Americans began to object to the number of immigrants as well as to the baggage they brought with them. During the 1850s, a nativist political party called the Know Nothings emerged, demonstrating the rise of concern about immigration. The Know Nothings were short-lived. I guess they got smarter. I don't know. But nativism itself will continue to influence American politics down to the present. How Americans reacted to immigrants depended on where those immigrants came from and the beggars that they brought with them. One author counts out Europeans as um, um, roughly 60% of all immigrants coming to the US between 1820 and 2000. Over that 180-year period, uh, the, uh, this author points out, 
Europeans accounted for basically 60% or, or three-fifths of all immigrants showing up. Another, using a slightly different um, uh, date, argues, points out that 36 million of the world's 81 million migrant, migrants um, between 1815 and 1914, again, most of Europeans arrived at the United States. And that the United States was the destination that was most frequently sought out by these immigration. So it's an enormous set of movements where Europeans and Americans are especially affected. At first, most immigrants to the United States came from Northern and Western Europe, especially the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Germany. Because these people were mostly white and often Protestant, they were seldom perceived as threatening. Um, after 1890, more people began arriving from Southern and Eastern Europe, particularly the Catholics and Jews. And as a result, the US became less welcoming. And when migrants from China and Japan and the Philippines began arriving on the West Coast in some of the same time periods, the United States began erecting formidable barriers to these newcomers. So such responses to the masses of immigrants once more contributed to redefining American citizenship. Who got to come in? Who got to be naturalized once they were here? Who couldn't be naturalized? Who could own land? What were their rights? All these things were up in the air as more and more people lined up to enter the country. Seattle, again, never led a charge in any of these realms of redefining citizenship. Nonetheless, the new realities affected who could and could not, would and would not, come to reside in Seattle and exercise the rights of American citizens, vote, serve on juries, uh, enlist in the military. Although relatively few blacks came to the, to the Northwest during the 19th century, white Americans in the region paid a lot of attention to those blacks. And their legal status in particular was uh, a point of disagreement. In the early 1840s, the provisional government of Oregon passed a law that prohibited blacks from residing there. Not just visiting or working, but even residing there. Why? Why did Oregonians do this? Why do they oppose the, uh, why do they oppose the presence of blacks? Um, it wasn't just that they opposed slavery. They were opposed to free blacks living in their midst, freeing that they might uh, undermine white economic opportunity or that they might make alliances with native peoples and, and cause a revolt and a variety of other things. Although not strictly enforced, this law remained on the books as Oregon became a territory in 1848 and a state in 1859. The law wasn't repealed until 1926. Washington did not follow Oregon's lead in excluding African Americans. Also, Washington, um, it had an anti-miscegenation law, but it abandoned it after 11 years. So in some ways, Washington was more uh, tolerant. Nonetheless, the black population of the Northwest remained small, partly because the territory was so remote from centers of the African American po population, especially in the southern states. The census recorded one black resident of King County in 1960, and in 1880, uh, I'm sorry, and, and 1870 and 1880, 34 blacks. Seattle's entire population in this time period remained pretty small. The city was remote, not only in relation to, to the south, but also to the northeast, the midwest, and the southwest. I would point out that King County already had about a third of its population foreign born. So the immigrants are already beginning to show up in the census numbers in pretty substantial numbers. The region's isolation ended in the 1880s, thanks again in large part to the Civil War. Here it was the economic policies of Civil War and Reconstruction, rather than constitutional amendments, that loomed so large. Prior to 1861, Southerners in Congress had um, opposed Republican initiatives to stimulate the economy. For example, the Republicans had proposed a substantial subsidy from the federal government to build a railroad across the continent to the, to the, Atlantic, to the Pacific. Um, Southerners, as I said, kept opposing these initiatives. But then when they seceded in 1861, the longer was that the opposition to what the Republicans wanted to do. 
And now the Republicans began to implement a strategy of stimulating the economy by um, giving away federal lands in the American West. In quick order, Congress passed the Homestead Act. Um, and in this case, um, recipients had to either be US citizens or declare their intent to become citizens. And also the Morrill Act, which created land-grant universities. Um, th this act gave states uh, parcels of federal land in the West and allowed them to sell the land or lease them and take the proceeds and help build colleges to encourage uh, farmers and engineers to go to high get higher education. In 1862 and 64, Congress arranged to transfer immense holdings of Western government land to private companies in return for those companies building railroads across the continent. The first one went to San Francisco in 1869, the second one to Puget Sound, arriving in 1883. No, immigrant labor, especially many from China, played a huge role in building these transcontinental lines and maintaining them. And now, the Northwest was much closer to the rest of the country. A cross-country journey that might have taken four to six months overland now took four to six days. The Republicans didn't stop once the Civil War ended. In 1867, they purchased Alaska from Russia. By 1900, Seattle had begun making Alaska into its hinterland. It's, uh, by that I mean Seattle had begun to make sure that for every ounce of gold or lumber or fish that came and went to Alaska, Seattleites controlled the, the profits, they controlled the proceeds, and they were making money by colonizing Alaska just had, Californians had made money by colonizing Puget Sound in previous decades. Additional Republican legislation facilitated access to fish, game, timber, minerals, again, especially on federal lands in the West. Taken together, these initiatives during and after the Civil War made the West and Seattle a more vibrant and more integrated part of the American and the global economy. These initiatives helped to generate a demand for workers that was seldom satisfied. Meaning that most of the time, more immigrants were welcome, simply because there weren't enough workers to develop the West. And Republican initiatives have made the region and its resources much more accessible. Note that none of these developments, none of this giving away of land, would have occurred without another long-standing confrontation, and that is the whites uh, confrontation against indigenous peoples. It's fundamental to keep this in mind. The government had lands to give away only because it had taken them from Native Americans. Right? Just, just dispossession made everything else feasible for these Republican initiatives in the Civil War and the Reconstruction Era. Federal government policies and actions, among other things, loomed large in the growth of Seattle, in part because of the development of railroads a town that had been only 1,100 in 1880, uh, 1870, and 3,500 in 1880, suddenly had 42,000 in 1890 and more than 80,000 in 1900. By 1900, Seattle ranked as the 48th largest city in the United States. Oh, you see that information. And by 1910, it was the 21st largest city in the United States. Of course, Seattle was also a city of newcomers. Only 14.5% of the population had been born in the Washington Territory as of 1900. Almost 60% had been born elsewhere in the US, especially in the states of the Midwest, um, Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, for example. And one of the reasons those Midwestern states loom so large in, in, in providing people for the Northwest is that the railroads come from Minneapolis and Chicago out to Puget Sound. That east-west transportation line uh, is what helps uh, populate the Northwest with Midwesterners. If 58.2% of satellites arrive from other American states, and if 14.5% of satellites have been born in Washington Territory or Washington State, what about the other 27.3%? They were foreign-born. They were immigrants. Immigration has long loomed large in Seattle's demography. In many ways, Seattle has mirrored the, the national patterns of immigration. The great majority of immigrants hailed from Europe, for example. The majority possessed at least some resources. 
um, immigration was mostly not feasible for the very poor. <clears throat> Until the 1930s, men outnumbered women in the migratory stream. Many of the newcomers did not expect to stay in North America, but rather hoped to build a fortune there and then go home. Often their decisions to go and to come were made in consultation with families where they originated, in Europe or Asia. So they, they, were, they were often single men, but they weren't really single. They were part of families making decisions about what to do with resources, how long to stay, how much money was needed, and so on. And often these decisions had to do with making their life better in their place of origin rather than having a good life in the United States. The U migration to the U.S. was just a stepping stone to more prosperity in their original hometowns. Wages and salaries in the United States were generally higher than in Europe and Asia. Jobs were more plentiful, but there were still plenty of pitfalls that might undermine immigration dreams and opportunities. So Seattle fits into these broadest patterns or, or generalizations we might make about immigration. But like most communities, it also had its own singular path, its own singular mixture of newcomers arriving from other places. Perhaps the most notable thing about Seattle and immigrants is that the city, in general, had more than its share of them. Between 1870 and 1980, each census found that Seattle had roughly twice as many foreign-born individuals per capita as did the nation as a whole. The first time that the fraction of immigrants fell below 20% was 1940, as the whole percentage of immigrants across the country decreased in that decade. Notice also that this data may actually understate the presence of immigrants in Seattle. The 1900 census counted not only those who were foreign born, but also those Seattleites born to foreign parents. So in 1900, just over one quarter of Seattle's population was foreign born. Just under one quarter was born to foreign parents. So you have households where both generations are um, speak, probably speak the language or have the traditions or practice the religion of where they came from. You have, you have um, uh, not just one generation, but two with the same ethnic background, same foreign language, uh, same set of expectations uh, in these uh, households. So Seattle has more immigrants per capita, almost by a factor of two compared to the rest of the country. The high percentage of former residents of Seattle compels us to think about what made for such a large immigrant population. Why were there so many foreign-born inhabitants? Some key factors that made the town so appealing. It was a port city, lots of ships and trains coming and going. It was close to international boundaries, including Canada's. It was close, relatively speaking, from a sort of West Coast point of view. It was close to Japan, Siberia, Korea, China. It, it had developed strong railroad connections back east. It had developed strong steamship connections across the Pacific. It was a conduit for people and goods and capital going to and from Alaska. And it had, it had an economy that was growing and that attracted workers from around the world. We sometimes think of Seattle as remote and isolated. We certainly act provincial at times. But in some ways, it's pretty clear Seattle was a true global crossroads by 1870, 1880, 1890, with more international traffic than a city of its size and age could have expected. Apart from how they came, there was another distinguishing pattern about Seattle that revolved around where they came from. First, let's look at the United States, uh, immigrants from the United States. <clears throat> oh, I, I need to back up, I'm sorry. Before I go on to immigrants from other countries, let me say that by the 1920s, um, within the United States, fewer and fewer people were coming from the Midwest to Seattle. More and more were coming from, from California and Oregon. This, I think, reflects the rise by the 1920s of California as a colossus a huge state, and um, it began to sort of be the place to, where, to send, send Seattleites or to welcome them home. So um, within the U.S., 
The Midwest became less of an influence after 1920. Never stopped being an influence, but became less of one with California and Oregon and some of the other western states, the mountain states, uh, sending more people to Seattle. Now let me turn to the uh, foreign-born immigrants rather than going moving past internal migration. For both the Emerald City and the nation at large, immigration remained largely the story of Europeans moving to the United States. However, those headed to Seattle tended overwhelmingly to become from nations in northern and, East and western Europe, Scandinavia, the UK, um, Germany, Ireland. The stereotype that Seattle represented a Pacific Coast Scandinavia does have some basis in the census numbers. Decade after decade, for more than 100 years, um, the same handful of nations furnished the bulk of European newcomers. Norway, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and Germany. Southern and Eastern European um, began arriving too as immigrants, but Seattle never got as many Slavs, Italians, Russians, or Hungarians as did other parts of the country. One country that sent almost none was France. I guess they felt the Northwest could not improve on what France had to offer. <laughs> they just are never high up in the numbers, even though they're part of the kind of Western and Northern Europe that makes such a huge contribution. <clears throat> uh, a couple of things to notice about this slide. Japan. So uh, Asian nations seldom appear in the top five or six countries uh, contributing immigrants to Seattle. But in this decade, 1910 to 1920, um, Japan's population grew. In fact, Seattle was, in the, was on the march. It was the second largest Japanese American community on the West Coast after Los Angeles. Also by this time, for reasons that have become clear, um, the Japanese in Seattle are making an attempt to get more and more Japanese people to immigrate, especially women and children. Um, let's look at the, the Russia figure. Uh, this figure here is um, a source of controversy and interest among historians. Uh, an historian of Seattle named Rich Berner, who for a long time was a director of the special collections in the, in the library, writes that when you see in the, in the early period uh, a quantity of Russians, you're probably actually seeing Jews who come from Russia. They might see this as Russians, but probably not. But he, he would argue that, he does argue that these figures for Russia really are talking about Jews. Um, how much this is accurate, I cannot say. Fortunately, um, Devin Nahr and then Yelena Campbell will be speaking about Jews and Russians and their experience with, with Seattle in the third and fourth uh, lectures. Um, so some of this issue, I hope, can get resolved. But these figures are interesting in, in all kinds of ways. <clears throat> Finally, the nation that consistently furnished the very most number of, the highest number of immigrants to, to Seattle wasn't in Europe. It was next door. Canada consistently sent the largest numbers to Seattle's former population. Both then and now, that is both then at the time and now among historians thinking about that time, these Canadian newcomers seemed to blend in, meaning that they spoke English and were white. Canadians in the United States have been called the invisible minority. Perhaps they blended in best in the American West. Some historians argue that Canadians in British Columbia and Alberta had more in common with people in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana than they would have had with provinces back east, Ontario, Manitoba, Quebec. So there's a sense not only that Canadians are a lot like the Americans, but also that Western Canadians are a lot like Western Americans. Um, whether these things are true or not, I'm not sure. They're sometimes more impressionistic than hard numbers. But um, this Canadian presence is something that I think deserves a lot more attention than historians have given it. Also, both Asians and Europeans figure out at different points that they can get into the United States easier if they go to Canada first and then come to the United States. Um, we're going to talk about the impositions of restrictions on, on immigration, especially quotas on Southern and Eastern Europeans. Until 1965, there were no restrictions or limits or caps 
on immigrants coming from Canada or Mexico. So the, all the countries are treated differently, and um, this is a crucial point to keep in mind. What to make of these immigrants from the north? I propose to see Canada really as an extension of Europe. Yes, I know it's a separate nation unto its own self, but in some ways it might be better characterized as a neo-Europe or an extension of Europe. It was known for a long time, of course, as British North America, and its non-native residents came primarily from Europe or had European backgrounds, spoke European languages. Now, immigration between Canada and the United States was distinctive. Um, from 1850 to 1950, speaking about nations as a whole, not the Northwest, but about all of Canada and all of what, uh, the United States, Canada sent far more migrants to us than we sent to Canada. One historian writes, despite Canada's much smaller population, the southward flow of Canadians has been a torrent compared to the trickle of American residents who moved north. In 1900, the census counted 1.2 Canadian-born residents of the United States. That 1.2 million was almost a quarter of the population of Canada itself. Think about that. A quarter of your population is now moving to the north to the United States. Another feature, a torn of Canadians may have come to the United States but they were one of the least eager to get naturalized. So they came in great numbers, but they didn't necessarily want to be Americans in terms of their citizenship status. Among Americans moving north, you have a different set of motivations. Canadians moving south often were concerned about economic issues. But the Americans moving north are often seeking something of a refuge. Blacks, for example, traveling the Underground Railroad often made it to Canada. The Lakota chief, Sitting Bull, escaped from the U.S. Army across the Canadian border in 1877. Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce in the same year tried to do the same thing, escape across the Canadian border. In the late 19th century, a faction of Mormons who disagreed with the church's decision to end polygamy tried to protect its own ways of doing things by moving across the border to Canada and trying to extend the practice of polygamy among themselves. And of course, in the 1960s or 1970s, young men from the United States went to Canada to avoid the draft and resist the war in Vietnam. So Americans going to Canada often had non-economic motives in mind. Um, and um, it's a, just a really unusual uh, kind of a <coughs> form of immigration. In discussing population movements between the United States and Mexico, scholars describe what they call a borderland to help account for the complexity of the patterns observed there. Perhaps we would understand Seattle better if we conceived of it as belonging to a northern borderland that linked Canada to the United States in enduring ways. In this borderland, we find people going back multiple times, back and forth, back and forth. Again. There's no cap on immigration coming from Canada to the United States. There's no limit. You can go back and forth as many times as you want. Transnational migration was not a one and done experience, especially because the US didn't have an annual cap on immigration. Going back and forth between these nations was, was actually kind of easy. S given that movement back and forth, north and south, it might be more helpful to conceive of that strip of land as a borderland a place where people go and come and go, come and go um, rather than a, a, a simple line that's a, a strong border. This is a zone of substantial movement to and fro, not just for jobs. You go to Bellingham Costco on a weekend, and the number of Canadian license plates there indicate there's a borderland here going on, people coming for specific purposes, back and forth, back and forth across the nation. Note that this Seattle borderland might be shared with Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Buffalo. Rust Belt cities that also have a Canadian population. Seattleites don't consider themselves part of the Rust Belt, but they might have something in common because of the Canadian origins of so many foreign born. One more detail. I just got obsessed with this Canadian stuff, I'm sorry. One more detail. More than 60%, more than 60% of Canadians live to the south of Seattle. 
Think about that. That means that along the borderland, of course, it's, it's the warmest part of Canada. It's the Great Lakes. Right? That borderland is much more populated by Canadians than it is by Americans. It's, it's a really interesting thing. While thinking about where Seattle's immigrants came from, it's a really to consider where they went to live in the city. In 1944, a University of Washington sociologist named Calvin Schmid began looking at um, immigration to Seattle. And his map's kind of funky. He, um, these are uh, a map of foreign-born Canadians living in Seattle. And th what he's done here is the, the bigger the circle is, the more there are arriving. Black indicates males. Uh, white indicates females. Um, Again, it's going to be hard to kind of read these. And then there's a number there that indicates a count. So the key is kind of difficult to, to grasp. But um, what Schmidt is doing here is sort of showing the increase in population over the years and where different groups are located. Norwegians, of course, are a big deal in Seattle. Swedes and Danes, English, Welsh, Scotch, Scottish, Irish and Germans. Notice all of these have the same, they all, they all have the same area. North Seattle, right? That's where they concentrate. All the Scandinavians are accounted for. The Italians are noted for having a little bit of a different pattern, more down here in the Rainier Valley. But again, um, you see where these folks ended up. Now, the census talked about these people, and Schmidt talked about these people in regards to the nations they came from, Finland, Russia, um, Sweden, Norway. But, um, those national origins matter much less than the fact that they're white. The fact that they're white allows them to live in the parts of Seattle that are the most segregated. You might live next to a, a Norwegian or a Russian or a, a, a Greek, but you're all going to be called white and you'll all be eligible to buy houses in the North End. For Japanese and blacks, it's different. You can't buy property, or lease property, or live on property outside of certain districts. You can't have households in the North End. Seattle's segregation by residents and by so many other factors is made clear. He's, think about all the time Schmidt spent, how many Canadian Americans, how many Swedish Americans, all that, and he overlooks the biggest point, that they're all white, and they can all choose to live in blocks that are not open to other groups. Um, by the way, the final lecture in this series will be by Jim Gregory, and it's on, going to be on redlining, on segregation in Seattle. I didn't mean to steal your thunder, Jim, but I wanted to get the appetite going. It's, it's, it's just, uh, he's done great work on it, and it's such a huge topic. In sum, Seattle was a highly discriminatory city. Immigration served to reinforce segregation as much as it worked to undermine it. Why do I raise this point? There are different views about how immigration shaped America. One view emphasizes the United States as a melting pot, suggesting different groups getting blended together. Another metaphor is a salad bowl. Each has something to contribute, even if they don't get melted together. They each have a flavor to add to the salad bowl. But neither of these metaphors conveys the kind of discrimination found in Seattle housing. This isn't a melting pot. This isn't a salad bowl. I tried to figure out if there was a metaphor that was appropriate to Seattle. And I began thinking about airplanes and first class and coach. It got to be kind of elaborate. And I was going to bring in airline food, but, but the thing fell apart. And <clears throat> part of the issue is it's so challenging because there's so many complexities or layers to this issue. I need some sort of metaphor that accounts for 
different levels of citizenship, first class, the second class, and so on. I need to account for different amounts of power or influence in society. I need to account for a growing amount of international marriages. I need to account for uh, a host of changes and change of reforms that take place over the decades, trying to make the system fairer sometimes, trying to make it harsher on some people and other times. There are so many different groups, women, blacks, Native Americans, Catholics, Jews, Mexican Americans, and the whites themselves, with their many Canadian, Norwegian, Sweden, and so on. It's just really difficult. Um, so many variables to make it difficult to have a nice, clean-cut metaphor. Thinking about how Americans conceive of citizenship, we have somewhat mythic ideas about citizenship and immigration in our, in our country. The myth of, of immigration, the myth of uh, citizenship, is symbolized by the Statue of Liberty, dedicated in 1886. Emma Lausch's poem, attached in 1903, is one of the most moving statements about the United States that there is. I can't read it because I'll tear up. But it's also aspirational rather than accurate as a description of what took place. In fact, people weren't unanimously thrilled about the Statue of Liberty in 1886. Women pointed out that no women were invited to the dedication ceremony. They had been left out. They chartered a boat and went out to be part of, the, part of the proceedings and pointed out that Liberty was a woman and she deserved the right to vote. <laughs> in Cleveland, a black newspaper was even more biting. These people aren't reverential for the Statue of Liberty like we are. They see it for what it is, a sham, well, partly a sham. And their language is, the, 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 the newspaper's language is, is um, sarcastic, bitter. And it reminds us that, yes, the 14th and 15th Amendments had been passed. Yes, they were in effect. But they still were not doing a whole lot of good in terms of creating equality, helping people who had been free of slavery for 20 years, helping them truly overcome the disadvantages, overcome the race, and, and move to a more equal position with others in society. The protests against the Statue of Liberty point to another national myth that is related to the message regarding the US being a welcoming land of opportunity. This other national myth says that things get better over time. America is the land of progress. Conditions improve, by and large. In terms of citizenship, the nation becomes more inclusive. In fact, when considering matters of, of citizenship, rather than emphasizing inclusion, it makes more sense to recognize the coexistence of inclusion and exclusion. On the inclusion side of the scoreboard, for decades, the US offered a relatively, door, a relatively open door to Europeans. It was one of the most generous places for newcomers in the world, in the modern world. Moreover, the nation steadily extended citizenship to more and more people. The 14th and the 15th Amendment made once enslaved African Americans into citizens. The 19th, the 19th Amendment granted women suffrage in 1920. In 1924, Congress extended Native, Native American citizenship for those Indians who hadn't achieved it yet. In both the case of women and indigenous peoples, Congress argued that their participation, their service, their sacrifices in World War I merited them citizenship, earned them citizenship. In this point of view, America does become more inclusive. The Statue of Liberty kind of works. From another angle, however, exclusion seemed fairly constant. Progress came slowly. Women said, we, we, we were able to vote in Wyoming in, in 1869, and you don't let the rest of us vote until, until 1919, 50 years later? Does it have to take that long? The argument against women and other groups not voting is they're incapable of self-government. Haven't men proved their own incapacity to good govern by that point? The inclusiveness of the Indian Citizenship Act, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 was compromised when Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah continued to deny Indians the right to vote for 20 more years. 
Sure, they became citizens, you just can't vote. That's like fourth class or fifth class. The 14th and 15th Amendments ought to have been broadly transformative. And yet, as the Cleveland newspaper indicated, there was still a lot of ways to go to make those amendments more meaningful. And in fact, it wasn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 that the 14th and 15th Amendment began to have more teeth and more punch. It's a long time. The South also devised a system of race relations called Jim Crow, which tried to keep formerly enslaved peoples, subservient and quote-unquote in their place. Lynchings were a part of that system of Jim Crow. And Jim Crow was hardly confined to the South. It spread around to the rest of the country. Consider the career of Horace Caton. A native of Mississippi, Caton moved to Seattle and in 1894 began publishing a newspaper called the Seattle Republican. Republican is a party of Lincoln, a party of emancipation. Moreover, Caton was a part of the Republican establishment. He served on party committees. His press published party or state uh, papers. He uh, made good money, and his family and he owned a home on Capitol Hill. But Jim Crow racism got worse, not better. Jim Crow racism became more pronounced in Seattle. Caton resisted. His newspaper featured stories about lynchings in the South. And in doing so, he lost subscribers and advertisers. He was no longer asked to serve on Republican Party committees. And he and his family were sued to get out of their house because it reduced the property values in a neighborhood going, going all white. So this Jim Crow comes home to roost. Things get worse, not better, in terms of race relations in Seattle. As with racial relations, so with immigration policy. We find both inclusion and exclusion. Immigration policies were tools for extending membership to the nation, for being more inclusive. However, from the beginning of the United States, um, with pretty good force over the period of decades from 1882 to 1942, 1882 to 1942, there was within the society and the immigration system a trend of counter, a counter trend of exclusion. And this limited the numbers of specific groups who could come, and in many cases denied the rights and privileges of citizenship to those who arrived. Exclusion was most pronounced among non-whites, and it affected Asian immigrants on the West Coast in particular. I indicated that at the start of this, as a nation, the US made it clear it wanted to continue immigration, wanted to continue to welcome immigrants. But at the same time, it passes a law in, 18, in 1790, the Act of Naturalization, that prohibits um, Asians and blacks from becoming citizens. So people are welcome to come and contribute to the society, but not, not all people can get naturalized, only free white persons. With the 14th Amendment, people of African descent can now be naturalized too. But after that happens, Asians are left out. They're not able to get naturalized. They can never become citizens. One way to limit the impact of immigrants on the border was to uh, restrict, restrict their ability to get naturalized. Another way was to put quotas or limits on how many could come. Around 1890, arriving Southern and Eastern Europeans began to outnumber um, immigrants to the US from Northern and Western Europe. One response was for Congress to establish quotas that reduce the number of immigrants arriving from the set nations of Eastern and Southern Europe. After the first Quota Act of 1921 and the second Quota Act of 1924, immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe declined. Those Southern and Eastern Europeans could still be naturalized. They could still become citizens because they're white. But their numbers declined because people are more suspicious or hostile towards, especially Catholics and Jews, as opposed to uh, people from Northern Europe. Asians now become known as aliens ineligible for citizenship, a, a, a euphemism coined to describe them. And in a series of laws by Congress and new decisions by the Supreme Court between 1882 and 1924, East Asians are barred from emigrating to the United States, all East Asians. In the mid-1920s, exclusion reigned supreme. 
I want to explain how this happened with experiences for groups in Seattle. But let me turn quickly to sort of one little detail before I get to those groups. The naturalization law of 1790 and modified by the 14th Amendment indicated that um, Asians weren't eligible to become citizens. But despite that fact, in 1910, the census counted about 1,400 Chinese and about 420 Japanese who had been naturalized, despite the law of 1790. How could that be? Until 1880, there is no federal system, comprehensive system, of immigration. It's farmed out to the states, the localities, and private companies. It's state courts or local courts that determine whether a person's worthy of becoming a citizen. It's captains of passenger ships who keep track of records and collect the fees and count the heads and report somebody who's sick who arrives. It's the city and state of New York forming Castle Garden, a reception center for, for immigrants, long before Ellis Island is, is run by the federal government. Also, it took a long time for the Supreme Court to go group by group and decide who was white and who wasn't white from Asia. All these things take time. And there isn't a big immigration bureaucracy for years and years. But between 1880 and 1920, beginning slowly and moving faster, a big immigration bureaucracy gets established. Part of that was Angel Island near San Francisco, where Asian immigrants began getting processed. Asians immigrated to the United States for most of the same reasons that Europeans did. Economic goals loomed large. Chinese, became, Chinese began coming to the West Coast during the California Gold Rush, but ended up living all around the West and, and working on a variety of things, including railroads, but also many other projects. The West generally had had a shortage of workers, and that meant that the Chinese were welcome. But keep in mind that the Western economy was full of booms and busts, and often those busts uh, made people feel more uh, comp competitive or disadvantaged by the presence of immigrants in the West. Um, political pressure from white working men resulted in the federal government in 1882 passing the Chinese Exclusion Act, which forbade Chinese workers, Chinese labor, from coming to the United States. Um, merchants, students, scholars, tourists could still come, but the great body of Chinese, the population, was no longer allowed to come to the United States. This is basically the first national piece of legislation in immigration policy. And what it does is exclude a group based on race. It's the first national policy piece of legislation. And what, what's it do? What about Seattle? Well, first of all, not all Americans, white Americans, agreed with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, a lot of people regarded the Chinese as really good laborers. The, they, their work on the railroads had been highly complimented. And here there's a bunch of people on the left, uh, communists, nihilists, socialists, Fenians, hoodlums, who they think ought to be expelled first before the Chinese are. Fenians refer to Irish Catholics and reflects the sort of anti-Catholic bias of a lot of American nativists. What about Seattle? Um, Seattle in the 1880s had a relatively small Chinese population of a few hundred, but it would attract the attention of white workers. And um, they felt that the, the fact that there were so many Chinese in Seattle was indicative of the fact that the exclusion law wasn't working. So they felt they would expel the Chinese. And in February 1886, white Seattleites, especially led by working men, by unions, um, chased the Chinese out of town. This was an act of vigilantism, and it followed the example of many other cities around the West. But, and this is a, a, a Portland drawing of different episodes in uh, rooting at the Chinese and the, the so-called riot that occurred. Um, opinions about the Chinese differed, however. Um, some communities did not want to expel the Chinese or started to do it and then backed off. Port Townsend started to do it, started to expel the Chinese, and then remembered how much the Chinese had invested in downtown buildings. Portland had a lot of people who wanted to expel the Chinese, but Portland had really strong business ties 
through shipping and other means with China and didn't want to antagonize their partners. So this expulsion wasn't uniform from town to town. But it was substantial, and it did reflect uh, um, an important set of attitudes that were then handed down when whites encountered other groups from across the Pacific. The 1920 census marked the first time that migrants from the Philippines were counted as part of Seattle's population. Exactly how many Filipinos there were is unclear. The census counted 537, but that figure was later lowered to 458. None of these people were categorized as foreign-born. In fact, they had been born and raised on American territory because the Philippines were part of the American empire. The US had acquired them in 1902 and defeating first Spain and then a Philippine insurrection movement to, to insert their control. And the archipelago became an American colony. I love this cartoon about what happened with American takeover and their increase in empire. Over here are states like California and Texas, children who are mostly white and are learning their lessons well, becoming educated to be self-governing. Here are the Americans' new acquisitions, the Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba. They're ready to be schooled. Again, the thought was, you can't be a citizen until you're educated to be self-governing. Out here, a Chinese kid looking inside. He's not, he can't come into school. Here, a Native American kid reading a book, but it's upside down. Here, an African American kid doing the windows. Not really educated to, to be a citizen. Punch was skeptical of what the US could and would do as it colonized parts of the world. As colonial subjects, Filipinos were assigned an anomalous status of American nationals. This meant that they could travel relatively freely between the United States and the Philippines, or between the Philippines and, and Hawaii, and they could stay relatively long times. So they had rights that other immigrants didn't always have. Other immigrants, they're not immigrants, they're, they're colonized, they're subjects. But American nationals were not eligible to vote in elections. In the 1930s, in the Great Depression, competition on the part of whites with these American nationals grew to be keen. And in 1934, Congress converted Philippines from American nationals to aliens ineligible for citizenship. They went from sort of having at least a foothold in the United States to having no foothold. And by 1946, they were their own country. And they now could immigrate, but they no longer were American nationals. Although they didn't, didn't have a large population, um, Filipinos thought, thought Seattle was important for them. It was halfway between the fish canneries of Alaska and the fields and ranches of California. And Filipinos came to Seattle to look, look for a job, the next job, often seasonal. So it was what one historian calls a colonial metropole, a, a, a town where people are steered to new opportunities, where they can spend a night or a week in a hotel, find a dentist, um, uh, get some mail. Um, Filipinos are described by this historian as both non-urban and non-stationary. No wonder the census couldn't get an accurate count. Um, some, however, were there for schooling. One of the sort of missions of Americans in the Philippines was to promote, promote education. And many Filipinos took this seriously. And they wanted to get their diplomas. They went to Seattle's public schools and the University of Washington and Seattle U to get their education and often went back to the Philippines and made a difference there in government or other fields. To a certain extent, in this time period, Seattle was also serving as a colonial metropolitan for native peoples. Increasingly over time, those native peoples came from wider and wider catchment areas. There were natives nearby on reservations, or not on reservations, nearby Seattle, but increasingly Indians from Alaska, British Columbia, Eastern Washington, Montana, from afar came to Seattle and also sought it out as a colonial metropole. So the idea doesn't apply just to, to Filipinos. It also applies to Native peoples as well. And you see the sort of numbers of Native peoples coming from a broader area, not being just local, but also being from other states and from British Columbia. So the Chinese got removed from Seattle in 1985, 86, 
they were back in time to help rebuild after the fire of 1889. So it wasn't a permanent um, dislocation. But the Chinese didn't grow up to be a very large community in Seattle. By contrast, Japanese Americans arriving in Seattle uh, amounted to 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, and became the second largest Japanese American community on the West Coast after Los Angeles. Um, whites saw the Japanese and imagined that they'd be replacements for the Chinese. To some extent, that was true. But um, the Japanese also had, did things differently. They couldn't escape white resistance. And in 1906, 1907, President Roosevelt negotiates the so-called Gentlemen's Agreement, which says that labor from Japan will not come. As with the, with the Exclusion Act of the Chinese, tourists, scholars, merchants, and other non-laborers could come. The Gentlemen's Agreement was more generous, though, to the Japanese by permitting children and families to come more readily. And this is important. The, 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 the country's going to close the door on Asian immigration. Chinese excluded 1882. Japanese limited 1906, 1907. Uh, in 1917, Congress passes the Asiatic Bar Zone, which eliminates other Asian groups from coming. And in the Second Quota Act of 1924, cuts off further immigration from Japan. Um, but the, the Seattle Japanese community is fairly large. And it's, it's, if you throw in King County, it's almost 10,000 people by 1920, by 1940. <clears throat> but there's something different about the Chinese, about the Japanese compared to the Chinese. And that is, the Japanese were able to get more women and children in and form more families, more nuclear families. This creates a fault line within the Japanese American community. Japanese parents are considered non-white and they're permanently banned from being naturalized. Japanese kids, Nisei, born in this country, by virtue of which amendment? Which amendment's birthright citizenship? 14. Same one we're looking at right now for other purposes, right? By virtue of the 14th Amendment, Japanese American kids born in this country are citizens with their first breath. They're going to have the right to have citizenship that the parents can never get in their lifetimes. That means that when, during World War II, the federal government wants to lock up Japanese, Amer Japanese Americans, it locks up 60% of the people that are, that are American citizens, who are American citizens. It locks up its own citizens. We can, we can date the beginning of the end of the uh, exclusion era very precisely. February 19th, 1942. President Roosevelt issues Executive Order 9066 authorizing the imprisonment of all Japanese on the West Coast. One of the most flagrant violations of civil rights in the US history. The Supreme Court initially supported this. In fact, cases supporting this were still on the books as late as 2018. But um, the, the Supreme Court begins to wobble about that in the case known as Ex parte Endo at the end of 1944. Also, by 1943, the Congress has repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act. What's going on with this? China is an ally in World War II, and it makes no sense to insult them so much with the Exclusion Act. And so the Congress in 1943 passes a law abolishing it. They still are not welcoming many Chinese, it's a small quota. But at least Chinese can now be naturalized in the United States. It's a gesture to an ally in World War II. Prior to Pearl Harbor, domestic considerations, labor supply, nativism, racism, competition with white workers, those factors are the largest in determining immigration policies. But World War II and the Cold War changed everything. They marked the end of American isolationism and the beginning of a new role in the world where public relations was important. If the Soviet Union criticized our treatment of minorities, criticized our treatment of other nations and their peoples, that was a sore point in a, in a world polarized by the United States and, and the Soviet Union, each side competing to get the goodwill of independent countries like India and elsewhere, to divide up Africa. 
So um, what had been a, a strong trend of exclusion begins to break down. And um, uh, the United States begin to reform its immigration policies. Year by year, law by law, from 1943 to 1990, the immigration restrictions, the quotas, the exclusion are defeated. The US develops explicit policies to deal with refugees, displaced persons, and asylum seekers. In the 1930s, America's quota system was so troubled that the United States couldn't come to the aid of many Jews trying to escape Russia. After World War II, they're more aware of displaced people and refugees and people seeking asylum. Um, Asians and everyone else becomes eligible to immigrate and to get naturalized. The racial barriers to that are struck down. There's a reduction of quotas based on national origins. There's still some national distribution, but by 1980, people think more in terms of hemispheres rather than nations in terms of allocating quotas or allocating uh, visas. There's more emphasis on family reunification, leading to a huge increase unexpectedly because of the trade migration. And there's more attention to job skills, whereas ethnic screening becomes less important. So um, the nation becomes more reform-minded about um, its, its immigration policy. I'll zip through these because I'm running a little late. As a result of these changes, for the first time, the number of immigrants from Europe is no longer the top number in 1980. This is, this is Seattle. Um, I could, the same data for the United States as a whole. Europeans are no longer number one. Asians and the Americas become larger. Also, caps are put on Canada and Mexico for the first time. It's not fair, compared to other countries, to let Canadians and Mexicans come in with a, without, without a cap. So that's another, uh, another thing that happened. Um, this is Seattle's racial makeup. I want to point out that, that so some groups down here to the bottom, Koreans, Vietnamese, that are again baggage from the Cold War, right? Alliances, um, obligations that had not been there before to the same extent. Um, I need to get to the end. Let me sort of leave you with immigration statistics for the last few years. Um, notice a couple of things. Canada no longer is number one, but it's still a contributor factor. Ethiopia had not been, no, no place in Africa had been a big deal. Now Ethiopia is. The two most populous countries in the world are now number one, right? That in some ways represents a fairer system. Um, <clears throat> one thing I noticed in a lot of my work is immigrants coming here saw something in Seattle that reminded them of home. That was obvious for Norwegians, the fjords, that was an obvious comparison. But Koreans, Germans, Japanese, others saw in Seattle something that was familiar to, the, the, to being home. That's why they wanted to stay here. Or that's one of the reasons they, they the, the developed or invented for staying here. That's a remarkable thing, that so many people from so many parts of the world can come here and see something they want to, that, that, that's familiar to their home. And I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sorry, I ran over time. But uh, that Canada stuff caught me up. <laughs> Blame it on the Maple Leaf. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Finley, for that masterful uh, integration of uh, the history of Seattle with uh, national and international forces. Uh, we learned so, so much. So we have time now for some questions. Uh, I hope you'll stick around for some questions. Uh, if you absolutely need to leave, please do so as quietly um, as possible. So the first question I have, can, concerns uh, King County. Uh, we're, we're in King County right now. This lecture took place in King County. Uh, when did King County come into existence and how did it get its name? Um, uh, King County has been King County since 
December 1852. Um, in 1995, 1985, King County was changed, um, the name changed from the original name, namesake to Martin Luther King. The original namesake was uh, William R. King of Alabama. He had been a representative and a senator and a diplomat, and uh, he had been the vice presidential candidate with Franklin Pierce in the election of 1852. They won, and Pierce was the president, King was the vice president. Um, Washington, well, King, Pierce County with Tacoma got named after Pierce, Franklin Pierce. King County got named after William R. King. Who did the naming? It was actually Oregon in December that had done the naming. Oregon, uh, at this point, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, parts of Wyoming and Montana are, are, are all the same territory, Oregon territory. But Oregon knows it cannot enter the Union, it, it remains that big. So it's trying to downsize. And so it's already doing that. Part of the strategy, though, is to, to, to help get Washington up and running. And so Oregonians in 82, December 82 name it King County. By March, um, Washington territory has been created, and Seattle has become King County's county seat. Who was William R. King? He was an Alabaman and a slaveholder. His peers respected him for his politics, his, his, um, his way with the legislatures. But um, he was a slaveholder, and in 1985, that he was a slaveholder meant that he wasn't worthy of being, he shouldn't have had the place in that room. But there's more controversy about William R. King. He's also said to have been gay. So he was a gay Alabama slaveholder. First of all, trying to figure out in the year 2024 what people in 1850 were saying about sexual orientation is a very difficult thing. And whether he was gay or not is a matter of debate and controversy. But when people began thinking, let's change the name to Martin Luther King, some said, well, we have a gay namesake. Do we want to, do we, do we want to forsake that namesake? And they thought that he might be considered because of his sexual orientation. Um, so he's actually quite an interesting, interesting story. So, Pierce and King are elected in, in November 1852. Oregonians name King County in December. Seattle's the county seat in January. In 1853, it was still took until March for the new president to be inaugurated. So although the county was being named after Pierce and King, it was Bill and Fillmore who signed the law in March to make, it, make Washington into a territory separate from Oregon. Um, so a long sequence of things. So King, we've always been King County. But it was the Oregonians who named us, trying to dump us off onto, to help, help us get on our way to be independent. Um, and um, yeah, so J w William R. King of Alabama. Thank you for that extremely comprehensive uh, answer. It's not nine o'clock yet, I can go How on. many of you uh, are, are surprised by the answer to the question? <laughs> Quite a few of you. Uh, that leads me to, to say that if you have questions and you have a card, an index card, which you received when you came in, if you could pass that to the aisle, uh, that would be great. Uh, and we have time for about, um, eight more, eight, about eight more minutes of questions. Uh, okay. Um, I have a question. Can you talk a little bit about what you see as the long-term Jap uh, effects of Japanese immigration to Seattle? Yeah. Um, just a, a real sort of narrow thing. I'm stunned at the, the richness of the city's response to and absorption in the incarceration and expulsion of Jeffrey Jim Wilbur II. The history of that episode and the way the story has been told and preserved, the way people resisted at the time, Gordon Hirabayashi, the way novelists like John Okada and uh, David Goodison and Hotel in the Corner Baron Suite, um, sorry, the author escapes me, the memoirs by Monica Sone. Monica Sone writing hers in 1953, 1953, in the middle of McCarthyism, criticizing the government for incarceration. These are just masterful works. The first group of Americans, uh, Japanese Americans, to be locked up, to be incarcerated, was on Bainbridge Island. They were sent to Manzanar. If you go to Bainbridge Island now, to Eagle Harbor, there's a stunning work of public art commemorating that episode. 
It's just rich and thoughtful. It's, Seattle was the home of much of the redress movement. It's the home of Densho, which is a, a tremendous archive about what happened. I would say that this community, especially in the way it's taught about, refused to um, forget about, uh, just uh, dealt with that episode, which is historical, but also um, important in a variety of other ways. Um, it just, it's just such a rich place to, to think about that topic. You can walk down the international district, right? Part Chinatown, part Japantown, part Filipino town. There are streets and buildings that honor Hiroyashi down there, and that's just remarkable. So it, the, the, the experience of, the, of Japanese Americans and the way they shared that and dealt with that here is just remarkable. And um, I don't th think that there's another city in, the, uh, in Seattle, or in, uh, I'm sorry, in the country that's quite like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, so the first question is, what accounts for the almost tripling of Seattle's population from 1900 to 1910? So the city was growing quickly anyway, right? Um, 40,000 in 1990, 80,000 in, in 1900. 40,000 in 1890, 80,000 uh, in 1900, and then 237,000 in 1910. So part of it's growing anyway, but something else happens. That is, in, between 1900 and 1910, Seattle annexes Ballard, Georgetown, uh, and a whole bunch of other parts of, around Seattle. So annexation is what really uh, supercharges that growth between 1900 and 1910. There's all kinds of large-scale um, annexations that complement or underscore the population increase. So uh, if I could follow up on that, what fuels annex this drive for annexation, uh, territorial expansion, the Seattleization of the, of the uh, hinterlands? So there's a number of crises. Um, the fire of Seattle, the Great Fire of 1889, um, the attempt to, where are you going to get your electricity? Who's going to build your roads? Once the roads are built, who's going to go back and convert them to suitable for cars and trucks? Um, there's all these things, all these utilities. Uh, where, where do we get our water supply? How do we get electric, electricity, right? The city of Seattle does a lot of these things as a municipality. And um, those amenities, those resources, the schools uh, is another one. All those things are um, important. But as Seattle spreads, as it grows, it also becomes more racist. One of the reasons is you build streetcar lines out to outlying areas, and people who don't want to live next to people of color in the downtown, or don't want to live close to Chinatown, don't want to live um, near African Americans in, in the center, they can take the streetcar out to um, uh, um, Madrona or West Seattle or other parts of the, they get around more easy and I, Quinto Taylor has a figure about this in 1900 I think there were African Americans living in every political precinct but in 1920 they're concentrated only in the central district so there's also segregation that accompanies this annexation and growth from streetcars and transportation and so on thank you so much I'm learning so much about this, my, the city I've lived in since 1992 uh, one last question. Uh, can you talk about immigration from East Africa into Seattle? Uh, when and why was Seattle a destination? So this very question attests to Seattle as a global crossroads over um, the centuries. Yeah, so um, I don't have a great answer for you on that. I tried to sort of look it up. I thought, where did these Ethiopians come from? And I didn't find it. I didn't crack down a great answer, but I have a couple of thoughts. Um, so immigration and, and natural, naturalization is something mostly done at the federal level. But cities try to get, the, get their w way in there. In the 1980s, a number of American cities declared themselves to be sanctuary cities. And this is often in response to the crisis in Central America, in Salvadorans and Guatemalans escaping um, regimes that the United States and Reagan are supporting in some ways. And uh, cities and towns like Tucson, Chicago, Seattle declare themselves sanctuary cities. And they say, we aren't going to help federal authorities do some tasks like de deportation. So Seattle becomes aware of, uh, becomes more liberal, becomes more sort of immigrant-centered, immigrant-centric. And in 2003, it changes its name. It's a welcoming city as opposed to a sanctuary city. And it has its own office of immigration and refugee affairs. Mm -hmm. So Seattle itself develops a consciousness about how it can intervene and help. And then I think um, 
uh, Ethiopian community members, some from the University of Washington, tried to create opportunities to have other Ethiopians come here, mm -hmm. mostly refugees. Um, the, the Congress and the president passed, I think in 1990, a special provision called diversity visa, and it tries to encourage visas to go into people, countries that have been under, underrepresented in the immigrant population. So a variety of factors, city and national, combine to make people more receptive to Ethiopians. Why Ethiopians as opposed to other groups, I can't say. I haven't found that out. But I did find out that there were a group of UW students who met on the Av in the Greek coffee shop that was there for a long time. Huh. They were the ones who, who, working with the city and working with uh, charitable organizations, medical organizations, uh, tried to provide a refuge for people escaping the, the civil war in Ethiopia. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'd like to just take, take this opportunity to, again to thank Nick Grawl and the rest of the History Department staff for all their heroic efforts over many, many months in helping to make this uh, series possible. And I'd like to thank Dean Harris for introducing it. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the Department of History, thank you so, so much. And let's have a huge hand for Professor John Finley.